a true teacher of universality. Walt Whitman is regarded by many as America's most original and foremost poet. He was born on the last day of May in 1819 on Long Island and lived there and in Brooklyn in his early years. Both sides of his family from English and Dutch descent went back generations in the New World. His schooling amounted to only about five years before entering the workforce in his early teens, apprenticing in the printing trade as a typesetter. This was his introduction to journalism, which became his main occupation. For the next 25 years of his working life, he wrote and edited newspapers. He worked as an itinerant school teacher, and he assisted with his family's business of building houses. Whitman remained unmarried his whole life, and there is evidence that he was likely homosexual. He died in March of 1892 at age 72, which was, by the way, 11 months after the passing of H.B. Blavatsky. As Russ said, on July 4th, an appropriately American holiday, 1855, at age 36, Whitman anonymously published Leaves of Grass. That book and its several enlarged revisions during the following 35 years was Whitman's life's work. Its cultural and literary impact is incalculable. The book was controversial from the start, embraced by a few enthusiasts, but dismissed as artless, vulgar, and coarse by many others. The pushback can be seen under three heads, which I will briefly trace. First, critics of literary form didn't know what to make of its freeform lines. Under what pretense could these grammatical fragments and run-on sentences, evidently undisciplined by rhyme and meter, go by the name poetry? The short answer is that Whitman was advocating and exemplifying a new world aesthetic of casualness and spontaneity. Quote, who troubles himself about ornaments or fluency is lost. What a man produces by contrivance or calculation counts for nothing compared to what a man is and the spontaneous expressions he throws off. This is from his 1855 preface. The poetic quality is not marshaled in rhyme or uniformity or abstract addresses to things, nor in melancholy complaints or good precepts, but is the life of these and much else and is in the soul. The profit of rhyme is that it drops seeds of a sweeter and more luxuriant rhyme and of uniformity that it conveys itself into its own roots in the ground out of sight. The rhyme and uniformity of perfect poems show the free growth of metrical laws and bud from them as unerringly and loosely as lilacs or roses on a bush and take shapes as compact as the shapes of chestnuts and oranges and melons or pears and shed the perfume impalpable to form the fluency and ornaments of the finest poems, or music, or orations, or recitations, are not independent, but dependent. All beauty comes from beautiful blood and a beautiful brain. If the greatnesses are in conjunction in a man or woman, it is enough. The fact will prevail through the universe. But the gaggery and guilt of a million years will not prevail. Whitman, of course, regarded, is regarded as the path breaker of free verse in the English speaking world. The iconoclast who broke open stuffy, effete conventions in literature. The second point is that critics were put off by the seemingly arrogant use of the first person. The bard's assertion that he was, quote, the poet of egotism. This ran counter to Victorian and Christian mores of self-effacement. It is interesting to note, by comparison, 
that only the previous year, 1854, Henry David Thoreau's Walden was published and introduced itself with these words on the writer's ego. In most books, the I, or first person, is omitted. In this, it will be retained that in respect to egotism is the main difference. We commonly do not remember that it is, after all, always the first person that is speaking. I should not talk so much about myself if there were anybody else whom I knew as well. Unfortunately, I am confined to this theme by the narrowness of my experience. Moreover, I, on my side, require of every writer, first or last, a simple and sincere account of his own life, and not merely what he has heard of other men's lives, some such account as he would send to his kindred from a distant land. For if he has lived sincerely, it must have been in a distant land to me. The mature editions of Leaves of Grass begin with the poem, One Self I Sing, in formal imitation of the Greek, of the ancient Greek bards, announcing their theme. Instead of The Great War I Sing, or The Hero's Adventures I Sing, Whitman's bard sings of the self. That this theme of the first person is given unapologetic emphasis in these two masterpieces of American literature, Walden and Leaves of Grass, appearing nearly simultaneously in the mid-1850s, seems more than coincidental. It portends a transformation in national cul culture and personal identity. One can't help comparing science today as it grapples with consciousness, gradually facing what science writer and Buddhist teacher Alan Wallace called the taboo of subjectivity. So 19th century American writers like Whitman and Thoreau were liberating the dignity and potential of each man or woman by challenging false modesty, fearful self-effacement, and entrenched group identities. Quote, I chant the chant of dilation and pride, Whitman trumpeted in the poem Song of Myself. Quote, we have had ducking and deprecating about enough. One's self is not the final word, however. The poem continues. One self I sing, a simple separate person, yet utter the word democratic, the word en masse. Here Whitman announces at the very start the most important key to everything that will follow, a dialectic between individual and collective identity, between individuation and belonging. He more clearly states in his preface, the soul has that measureless pride which consists in never acknowledging any lessons but its own but it has sympathy as measureless as its pride, and the one balances the other, and neither can stretch too far while it stretches in company with the other. The inmost secrets of art sleep with the twain. The greatest poet has lain close betwixt both, and they are vital in his style and thoughts. Finally, third, critics were offended by Whitman's celebration of the body, death, and sexuality. Long before Jung formulated his theory of the shadow, Whitman was shining a spotlight on these existential essentials of life and on the untruth that makes them so volatile. Whoever you are, come forth or man or woman come forth. You must not stay sleeping and dallying there in the house, though you built it, or though it has been built for you. Out of dark confinement, out from behind the screen, it is useless to protest. I know all and expose it. Behold through you as bad as the rest, through the laughter, dancing, dining, 
supping of people inside of dresses and ornaments, inside of those washed and trimmed faces, behold, a secret, silent loafing and despair. No husband, no wife, no friend trusted to hear the confession. Another self, a duplicate of every one, skulking and hiding it goes. Formless and wordless through the streets of the cities, the light and bland in the parlors, in the cars of railroads, in steamboats, in the public assembly, home to the houses of men and women, at the table, in the bedroom, everywhere. Smartly attired, countenance smiling, form upright, death under the breast bones, hell under the skull bones, under the broadcloth and gloves, under the ribbons and artificial flowers, keeping fair with the custom, speaking not a syllable of itself, speaking of anything else, but never of itself. Jungian psychology, as I understand it, proposes that the mind constructs our self-image by selective process. It illumines and exaggerates some characteristics by casting others into the shadow, just as a spotlight on the stage. Remember that persona means mask, a term derived from the Greek theater. This edited selfhood becomes a vulnerability. Shadowed facts become feared and demonized. The effort of repression is a tiring defense and lapses into denial, hypocrisy, and projection. Whitman set off alarms in polite society with his open-eyed acknowledgement of what he called primal sanities. Predictably, he was accused of sensualism and sensationalism. But paradoxically, what is missed by superficial readers is Whitman's larger purpose, a call for wholesomeness and an inculcation of radical personal integrity. There is nothing pornographic in Whitman's treatment of sex. As Thoreau admitted in a letter to Harrison Blake, though the sensuality clearly bothered the bachelor from Concord. Whitman was instructing intuitive readers on the necessity for integration of the personal shadow a generation before Jung. His larger object was liberty from self-mistrust, and he knew he had to squarely strike that inflamed Victorian nerve that hid the body, sex, and death in shadow and shame. Whitman presumed to announce that Eden is a state of mind and anyone, no matter how fallen, can reclaim their innocence. This was, of course, at odds with the theology of original sin and Whitman had to be in league with demons to declare such a thing, at least according to religionists. The sad irony is that the very defensiveness Whitman is eager to dispel becomes the chief barrier to understanding his purpose. We were attracted by the very singular title of the work to seek the work itself. And what was thought ridiculous in the title is eclipsed in the pages of this heterogeneous mass of bombast, egotism, vulgarity, and nonsense. The beastliness of the author is set forth in his own de description of himself, and we can conceive no better reward than the lash of such a violation of decency as we have before us. Speaking of this mass of stupidity filth, the criterion said, it is impossible to imagine how any man's fancy could have conceived it unless he were possessed of the soul of a sentimental donkey that he died of a disappointed love. This book should find no place where humanity urges any claim to respect, and the author should be kicked from all decent society as below the level of the brute. 
There is neither wit nor method in his disjointed babbling. And it seems to us he must be some escaped lunatic raving in pitiable delirium. We should say that's from a review uh, in the Boston Intelligencer in 1856. Whitman is poetry's butcher. Huge, raw collops slashed from the rump of poetry, and never mind gristle, is what he feeds our soul with. As near as I can make out, his argument seems to be that because a prairie is wide, therefore debauchery is admirable, and because the Mississippi is long, therefore every American is God. That's from a letter of a contemporary poet, Sidney Lanier. Now let me say a few things about Whitman in the context of the other three figures we've considered this month. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Margaret Fuller, and Henry David Thoreau. In some exterior features, he is certainly an outsider. Whitman was a New York rowdy, not part of the placid literary renaissance centered in Concord, Massachusetts. Whitman also was not college educated like Emerson and Thoreau. Margaret Fuller, though not college educated only because she was a woman, certainly achieved the equivalent through her tutors, pursuing advanced studies in the classics. Whitman was, however, a voracious reader and an obsessive autodidact. But it is the internal themes of his art that connect him most to the New England transcendentalists. He incubated under the influence of Emerson's essays. His exalted vision of the poet was intellectually fathered when he attended and reviewed Emerson's lectures at the New York Society Library in 1842. And of course, we heard uh, from the beginning, those lectures were the basis for the essays. Uh, and we see a direct influence on Whitman. Whitman was 22 at the time, and it was 13 years before he would publish Leaves of Grass. His writing eventually earned the recognition, as we heard, of both Emerson and Thoreau. It is worth noting that as a poet, Whitman was a late bloomer. Leaves of Grass was published when he was 36 years old, at a time when life expectancy in the U.S. ranged from 38 to 44. By comparison, think of the brilliant and accomplished Fuller, who passed away at the age of 40, or Thoreau, who was dead by 44. Another distinction worth noting, of the four writers we've looked at in the series, only Whitman lived beyond the year 1875, when the modern theosophical movement was founded in New York City. True, Emerson was physically alive, but mentally far in decline by then. It's not surprising that Whitman has stirred and continues to stir up attention among theosophists. You find frequent references in his writing to the doctrines of karma, reincarnation, pluralism, universal truth, immortality, the probationary and educational function of life, the equality of the sexes and races, spiritual evolution, and even the avatar and the elder brothers of the race. Of course, you don't necessarily find these terms, this is the nomenclature that theosophists use, but the doctrines, are unmistakably expressed and may readily be cited. That said, Whitman would and did bristle at the mention that he belonged to some school or other. He wanted to stir people up and set them free from narrow dogmas and ideas, from Victorian and Christian emotional inheritance of shame and self-diminishment, to infuse in readers who were ready a vital self-confidence spontaneity of expression, renewed wonder at the natural world, and a spiritual feeling of belonging to the cosmos. He was a man of heart who was initiating his readers into the way of the heart. His path involved the whole person, not merely the intellect. Quote, I am the poet of the body, and I am the poet of the soul. The pleasures of heaven are with me, and the pains of hell are with me. The first I graft and increase upon myself, the latter I translate into a new tongue. He chided the proud libraries, which could never provide a fitting home for his book. He was not writing only for the literary elite, 
but for the common man or woman, who he imagined would read his poems in the open air during respites from their daily toil. He loved them and he called for their love in return. Whitman lived for 17 years after the inauguration of the Theosophical Society. And there is some traceable mingling of his sphere with its members. Sylvester Baxter, a staff writer for the Boston Herald, was a friend and admirer of Whitman. Baxter lobbied his congressman, in fact, to help Whitman secure a government pension. But Baxter was also a member of the TS and assisted his friend W.Q. Judge with the publication of The Path magazine. Judge and Baxter co-wrote, quote, Poetical Occultism, an article on Whitman's work, which was sent to Whitman. Baxter told Whitman that the poet was really, in fact, a theosophist. Other friends in turn found in Whitman a socialist or an anarchist. Such is the open texture and universality of the leaves that its language accommodates the perspectives of myriad of idealists. Quote, I am large, I contain multitudes, wrote Whitman toward the end of Song of Myself. Impatient of being pigeonholed, he mused to his friend Horace Trebell, quote, how much of me is going to be left for myself after all the claims of the radicals are satisfied, unquote. In his own words, he was untranslatable, as genuine art always is. A direct experience of a great painting, or a symphony, or a poem, is not finally reducible to any explanation. Knowing about is not the same as knowing. About is always on the outskirts. Comparing himself to a hawk in the last section of Song of Myself, Whitman says, quote, I too am not a bit tamed. I too am untranslatable. I sound my barbaric yop over the roofs of the world. In another article in the Path magazine, editor W.Q. Judge penned some deeply suggestive lines about the poet. He begins by claiming that no body of hierophants has taken up residence in Europe or America, for society and culture are yet based on externals and economics. However, there is real work going on, preliminary work at the mental and psychic level, which metaphorically corresponds with the clearing of trees before agriculture and settlement may take place. And that work is performed by, quote, messengers, Judge says. These messengers, quote, possess a faith that carries them through a long course of effort without a glimpse of those who have sent them, unquote. They must be undeterred by the critical attitudes of those who, wanting a sign, doubt that these messages really do come from higher authorities. Yet at the same time, some of them now and then see very plain evidence of the fact that they are constantly assisted, said Judge. He then appears to identify Whitman as such an example, for he quotes the poem, To Him That Was Crucified, in full. My spirit to yours, dear brother, do not mind because many sounding your name do not understand you. I do not sound your name, but I understand you. I specify you with joy, O oh my comrade, to salute you and to salute those who are with you before and since and those to come also that we all labor together, transmitting the same charge and succession. We few equals, indifferent of lands, indifferent of times, we enclosers of all continents, all castes, allowers of all theologies, compassionators, 
perceivers, rapport of men. We walk silent among disputes and assertions, but reject not the disputers, nor anything that is asserted. We hear the bawling and din. We are reached at by divisions, jealousies, recriminations on every side. They close peremptorily upon us to surround us, my comrade. Yet we walk unheld, free, the whole earth over, journeying up and down till we make our ineffaceable mark upon time and the diverse eras, till we saturate time and eras, that the men and women of races, ages to come, may prove brethren and lovers as we are. A paragraph later in the same article, William Kwan Judge quotes a line from Whitman's Song of the Rolling Earth, quote, when the materials are all prepared and ready, the architects shall appear. Whitman appears to make a similar distinction in his rather occult poem, The Answerer. Rather than speaking in terms of adepts and messengers, it is the, quote, poet that is distinguished from, quote, the singers. The poet strikes a keynote. The singers are not original, they are specialists who extend and apply the resounding vibration in particular directions. Their inspiration is derived. Through them is transmitted overtones and echoes. The singers are many and various. The birth of the true poet, however, is rare. Centuries pass between such births. Time, always without break, indicates itself in parts. What always indicates the poet is the crowd of the pleasant company of singers and their words. The words of the singers are the hours or minutes of the light or dark, but the words of the maker of poems are the general light and dark. The maker of poems settles justice, reality, immortality, his insight and power encircle things and the human race. He is the glory and extract thus far of things and of the human race. The singers do not beget, only the poet begets. The singers are welcomed, understood, appear often enough, but rare has the day been, likewise the spot, of the birth of the maker of poems, the answerer. Not every century, nor every five centuries has contained such a day for all its names. What do we make of this elevated concept of the poet? I'm going to spend the rest of the time on that question because it's key to oneself, I sing. This question is key to a deeper appreciation of Whitman, expanding our regard for him from that of a mere literary curiosity to a figure of spiritual significance. Poetry for Whitman was not merely or fundamentally the art of wordplay, nor was the true poet necessarily someone who writes and publishes poems. For sure, the poet may use words, but words are only a means. They have no inherent value as objects of art. Ultimately, poetry is the spiritual influence that passes between one soul and another. Rooted in the inward spiritual culture of the poet, verbal and written expressions will be as spontaneous and unstudied as the appearance of wild grass. The self 
of Whitman's poetry is varied and fluid. His poems speak to varying levels and states of consciousness. Sometimes it is the personality of the poet himself, Whitman even using his own name in the poem. Walt Whitman, a cosmos of Manhattan, the sun, turbulent, fleshly, sensual, eating, drinking and breeding, no sentimentalist, no stander above men and women or apart from them, no more modest than immodest. At other times, it is the soul behind that personality, transcendent, impersonal, detached, non-judgmental. In Song of Myself, the poet declares, quote, trippers and askers surround me, and contrasts distracting personal concerns with the presence of the witness within. Trippers and askers surround me. The people I meet, the effect upon me of my early life or the ward and city I live in or the nation, the latest dates, discoveries, inventions, societies, authors old and new, my dinner, dress, associates, looks, compliments, dues, the real or fancied indifference of some man or woman I love, the sickness of one of my folks or of myself, or ill-doing or loss or lack of money, or depressions or exultations, battles, the horrors of fratricidal war, the fearful and doubtful news, the fitful events. These come to me days and nights and go from me again, but they are not me myself. Apart from the pulling and hauling stands what I am. Stands amused, complacent, compassionating, idle, unitary, looks down, is erect, or bends an arm on an impalpable certain rest, looking from side curved head curious what will come next, both in and out of the game, and watching, and wondering at it. Still at other times, the self is plastic and sympathetic in the extreme, finding itself mirrored in all peoples, all occupations, all natural forms, all afflictions. Many passages in Leaves of Grass read something like the 10th chapter in the Bhagavad Gita, a dizzying deluge of ideas and objects seemingly ordered by free association. In section 15 of Song of Myself, for example, we find some 60 lines of images, apparently arranged in no linear logic. The reader's experience is that of being force-fed a montage of snapshots. The pure contralto sings in the organ loft. The carpenter dresses his plank. The tongue of his foreplane whistles its wild ascending lisp. The married and unmarried children ride home to their Thanksgiving dinner. The pilot seizes the kingpin. He heaves down with a strong arm. The mate stands braced in the whale boat. Lance and harpoon are ready. The duck shooter walks by silent and cautious stretches. The deacons are ordained with crossed hands at the altar. The spitting girl retreats and advances to the hum of the big wheel. And that's only eight lines. On and on it goes. The reader, bewildered by the torrent, likely overwhelmed, even fatigued, wondering, where does it all tend? When cultural critics bemoan today's short attention spans and music videos that average 0.8 seconds in their cuts, I think of Whitman's verbal slideshows in the mid 19th century at once fragmenting attention but also challenging us to thread together those fragments on the thread of the self. Commenting on this aspect of the poet's art, Thoreau said that Whitman takes him to the hilltop expecting to see wonders, 
and then throws in a ton of bricks. But Whitman is very intentional in his method. He ends section 15 by stepping away from the detail and telling us why. And these tend inward to me, and I tend outward to them, and such as it is to be of these, more or less I am. And of these one and all, I weave the song of myself. Or again, a bit earlier in the poem, Whitman's quote, a fluid and swallowing soul. In me, the caresser of life, wherever moving, backward as well as forward slewing, to niches aside and junior bending, not a person or object missing, absorbing all to myself and for this song. Another facet of the poet in much of Whitman's work is the hierophant. The poet, the voice and presence in Leaves of Grass is a mystery figure and a revealer of hidden things to those he finds worthy. This is a compelling and beguiling aspect of Leaves of Grass as generations of readers will testify. Quote, Camarado, this is no book, who touches this touches a man. Just as we find in Rumi or Hafiz, Whitman's poet reaches intimately to his reader in love and affection and solicits the same attitude in return. He writes lovingly to his future readers, commanding them to challenge the maya of time and space that only appears to separate poet from reader. And always, he hints at the inner rewards for those who qualify. From Song of Myself. Have you reckoned a thousand acres much? Have you reckoned the earth much? Have you practiced so long to learn to read? Have you felt so proud to get at the meaning of poems? Stop this day or night with me, and you shall possess the origin of all poems. You shall possess the good of the earth and sun. There are millions of suns left. You shall no longer take things at second or third hand, nor look through the eyes of the dead, nor feed on the specters in books. You shall not look through my eyes either, nor take things from me. You shall listen to all sides and filter them from yourself. In the poem, starting from Pamanok, the poet implores, with me firm holding, yet haste, haste on, for your life adhere to me. I may have to be persuaded many times before I consent to give myself really to you, but what of that? Must not nature be persuaded many times? No dainty dolce affectuoso I, bearded, sunburnt, gray-necked, forbidding, I have arrived to be wrestled with as I pass for the solid prizes of the universe. For such I afford whoever can persevere to win them. In Song of the Open Road, Whitman calls his bravest readers to a spiritual homelessness, which tolerates no inertia, knows no rest, covets no possession, clings to no relationship, and remains ever vigilant for the call to depart. Allo, whoever you are, come travel with me. Traveling with me, you find what never tires. The earth never tires. The earth is rude, silent, incomprehensible at first. Nature is rude and incomprehensible at first. Be not discouraged. Keep on. There are divine things well enveloped. I swear to you, there are divine things more beautiful than words can tell. Allo, we must not stop here. However sweet these laid up stores, however convenient 
this dwelling, we cannot remain here. However sheltered this port, and however calm these waters, we must not anchor here. However, welcome the hospitality that surrounds us. We are permitted to receive. It is but a little while. Listen, I will, I will be honest with you. I do not offer the old smooth prizes, but offer rough new prizes. These are the days that must happen to you. You shall not heap up what is called riches. You shall scatter with lavish hand all that you earn or achieve. You but arrive at the city to which you were destined. You hardly settle yourself to satisfaction before you are called by an irresistible call to depart. You shall be treated to the ironical smiles and mockings of those who remind, remain behind you. What beckonings of love you receive, you shall not answer with passionate kisses of parting. You shall not allow the whole of those who spread their reached hands toward you. In the long prose poem prefaced to the 1855 edition of Leaves of Grass, the poet becomes the initiator who gives spiritual birth to his disciple. A great poem is no finish to a man or woman, but rather a beginning. Has anyone fancied he could sit at last under some due authority and rest satisfied with explanation and realize and be content and full? To no such terminus does the greatest poet bring. He brings neither cessation or sheltered fatness and ease. The touch of him tells in action. Whom he takes, he takes with firm, sure grasp into live regions previously unattained. Thenceforward is no rest. They see the space and ineffable heat that turn the old spots and lights of the dead vacuums. The companion of him beholds the birth and progress of stars and learns one of the meanings. Now there shall be a man who heard out of tumult and chaos. The elder encourages the younger and shows him how. They too shall launch off fearlessly together till the new world fits an orbit for itself and looks unabashed on the lesser orbits of the stars and sweeps through the spring shall never be quiet again. The evolution of the true poet is no easy matter, according to Whitman. The true poet is cosmos, like the true. He is a microcosm of the macrocosm in an intense and intentional way. The poet absorbs his nation, culture, and era, and mirrors the same in his life and influence. His vast and variegated self-awareness is, paradoxically, also his selflessness. In the words of the Voice of the Silence, he has attuned his heart and mind to the great mind and heart of all mankind. His receptivity is equal to his power. His hearing is matched by his speech. The poet's audience resonates to him because he is simpatico to the needs of his era and culture. Apart from his call, latent potentials cannot awaken. Yet when, quote, the divine power to speak words is attained, he commands not merely sounds from his mouth or marks with his pen, but collective mental material and cultural forces. Vocalism, measure, concentration, determination, and the divine power to speak words. Are you full-lunged and limber-lipped from long trial? 
from vigorous practice, from physique? Do you move in these broad lands as broad as they? Come duly to the divine power to speak words, for only at last, after many years, after chastity, friendship, procreation, prudence and nakedness, after treading ground and breasting river and lake, after a loosened throat, after absorbing eras, temperaments, races, after knowledge, freedom, crimes, after complete faith, after clarifyings, elevations, and removing obstructions, after these and more, it is just possible that there comes to a man, a woman, the divine power to speak words. Then toward that man or that woman, swiftly hasten all. None refuse, all attend. Armies, ships, antiquities, libraries, paintings, machines, cities, hate, despair, amity, pain, theft, murder, aspiration, form in close ranks. They debouche as they are wanted to march obediently through the mouth of that man or that woman. I think, I think we skipped a, uh, a slide, Kirk. There should have been a slide next. So go to the next one. Yeah. Thank you. I think we have to approach Whitman's encomiums of the poet with something like the theosophical view of the adept. The adept is no gratuitous appearance. He is the efflorescence of the age. The adept is as necessary to the evolution of others as the heart or brain is essential to the rest of the body. It is impossible to conceive an adequate conception of human evolution that does not give central emphasis to avatars and adepts. For Whitman, the poet, with a capital P, is the essential heart of a culture. And this is again from his 1855 preface. Of all mankind, the great poet is the equable man. Not in him, but off from him, things are grotesque or eccentric or fail in their sanity. Nothing out of its place is good, and nothing in its place is bad. He bestows on every object or quality its fit proportions, neither more nor less. He is the arbiter of the diverse, and he is the key. He is the equalizer of his age and land. He supplies what wants supplying and checks what wants checking. If peace is the routine, out of him speaks the spirit of peace, large, rich, thrifty, building vast and populous cities, encouraging agriculture and the arts and commerce, lighting the study of man, the soul, immortality. In war, he is the most deadly force of the war. Who recruits him recruits horse and foot. He fetches parks of artillery, the best that engineer ever knew. If the time becomes slothful and heavy, he knows how to arouse it. He can make every word he speaks draw blood. Whatever stagnates in the flat of custom or obedience or legislation, he never stagnates. The time straying toward infidelity and confections and persiflage, he withholds by his steady faith. He spreads out his dishes. He offers the sweet, firm-fibered meat that grows men and women. His brain is the ultimate brain. He is no arguer. He is judgment. He judges not as the judge judges, but as the sun falling around a helpless thing. As he sees the farthest, he has the most faith. His thoughts are the hymns of the praise of things. In the talk on the soul and eternity and God, off his equal plane, he is silent. He sees eternity less like a play with a prologue and a denouement 
he sees eternity in men and women. He does not see men and women as dreams or dots. The poet, quote, does not see men and women as dreams or dots. He is only finally vindicated by the living elevation of his culture, not by literary prizes or inclusion in prestigious anthologies. Poetry, not as an end in itself, but as a means to beautiful, whole, vibrant, candid, fearless people. Quote, produce great persons, the rest follows. Unquote. The poet animates objects, moods, and events, but, quote, folks expect of the poet to indicate more than the beauty and dignity which always attach to dumb real objects. They expect him to indicate the path between reality and their souls. The messages of great poets to each man and woman are come to us on equal terms. Only then can you understand us. We are no better than you. What we enclose, you enclose. What we enjoy, you may enjoy. Did you suppose there could be only one supreme? We affirm there can be unnumbered supremes and that one does not countervail another any more than one eyesight countervails another, and that men can be good or grand only of the consciousness of their supremacy within them. In conclusion then, the true poet is not marshalling his art to groom language only, fashioning words into divine forms, but his aim is to produce great persons. Whitman's promise to his reader is not simply to get at the meaning of poems or even to find the origin of all poetry, but to become a living poem oneself. The proof of a poem is not ink on a page, but a living unity of soul and body. We will close here with one final passage. It's a kind of credo for Whitman Files. This, this is, is what, what you, you shall, shall do. do. Love the earth and the sun and the animals. Despise riches. Give alms to everyone that asks. Stand up for the stupid and crazy. Devote your income and labor to others. Hate tyrants, argue not concerning God. Have patience and indulgence toward the people. Take off your hat to nothing known or unknown, or to any man or number of men. Go freely with powerful, uneducated persons, and with the young, and with the mothers of families. Read these leaves in the open air, every season of your life. Re-examine all you have been told at school or church or in any book. Dismiss whatever insults your soul. And, and your, your very flesh, flesh shall, shall be a great, great poem, poem. And have the richest fluency. Not only in its words, but in the silent lines of its lips and face. And between the lashes of your eyes and in every motion and joint of your body. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, can everyone uh, maybe switch to gallery view for our discussion session? We'll have, we have 20 minutes or so to um, talk about what we've heard. Um, I can't help but blurt out one of the first things that came to mind after listening to all of this. Um, 
we have in, in, the, in the Tempest, Miranda, after seeing people that she had never seen before, burst out and says, oh, brave new world that has such people in it. This seems to be an apt sentiment for learning about a, a soul of the magnitude of Walt Whitman. Okay, so um, let me, I know that uh, there was a couple things that were in the chat that I can read out. Um, Isabel makes the comment that uh, she really loved the quotation or the comment, Eden is a state of mind. Would anyone like to add to that? Would anyone like to um, add a, a thought or a question to that idea? Eden is a state of mind. Go ahead, Keith. Well, I saw you unmuted, so go ahead. Um, you know, what we were saying um, and, and quoting Whitman about how the true art is the um, is the art of ourselves is so like the quote that was uh, prominent in the Thoreau uh, program we had a few weeks ago um, from Walden, um, and um, the w w when you said uh, what Eden is what was the rest of it? Eden is a state of mind. Right, right. <laughs> so it's not. It's not what you have, it's not where you are, it's the state of consciousness that you live in. Uh, but Jerry, I did wanna ask this, are these programs being recorded so that they can be shared with others at a later time? That's the plan. That's okay. The, that's the plan. So th these, these last four weeks have been extraordinary and I wanna thank you and everyone who has participated to put them together. And I hope that I could help uh, maybe in the future in uh, whatever you take on next in a similar vein. Well, I can certainly tell you there, uh, all four of them were done lovingly. Um, I was thinking that Laura, it, rather than read out what you wrote, can you just- Could, um, I, could I make a comment? Could a I make a comment about the Eden one? Just uh, oh. real quick. Um, you earned it. <laughs> you, uh, one runs up against uh, theological prejudice. You know, I think it's the, I'm not real good with my church history, but the Pelagian heresy or the Pelagian heresy, Pelagius was, um, you know, the one who said uh, that um, original, you know, questioned the dogma of original sin. Because of course the dogma of original sin means there is a barrier between you and paradise and the church and the priestcraft and the sacraments hang between and as well as the sacrifice of Christ and all of that. So for anyone to, to deny that and to say that Eden can be entered into as a state of mind is, is really a, a heretic in that regard. And Whitman has a wonderful poem called We Too, uh, T-W-O, and he, where he and another, uh, and at one, one point I was involved in a staging of this and this couple, staged this together and it was turned into a dialogue. But it's basically about how they, how are they, uh, the human being can enter back into nature, back be, um, uh, and the alienation from nature and at atone in that sense of, of unity again. You know, uh, we too long have we been absent from nature, but now we return. And uh, he's answered back, we are nature, you know, and then they go through all the natural forms, how they become the birds, they become the roots, they become the minerals. And it's, it's this beautiful, beautiful affirmation. So that was, that was very important to Whitman's program, that there's a primitive consciousness that can be recovered again. Thank you. Anyone else want, to, before we move on to uh, Laura's comments, would anyone else like to continue along on this same vein, say something more about this idea? Um, Please go ahead, Ray. Is that you, Ray? Yes, but I, I'm not sure. I think it relates to the idea because Laura's uh, comment 
is kind of a door opening and you you can well i wanted to stay with this eden is this state of mind just for a moment longer so if you, go ahead ray and and say your what you want to say well well i think i think this fits what I, as we're i these are kind of my introductions to the whole project that you're all doing and i'm so deeply touched by all of them and all I would like to say is, since it's a small group here, I wouldn't want to say that Joseph's presentation on this was uh, um, an opening that will not be closed, in, in certainly in, in the way it affected me, um, that the quotes kind of created, as he said, more, more than words can tell. Um, and, and they kind of opened the space that was quite joyful. and actually brought up what I, that the feeling that of the, uh, both the suffering and the joy that is occurring in our lives and can occur every day. Um, one measure of it that I've found is that it, it can bring tears up in one's life. And I kind of feel that if you can't find a reason to have that arise in your chest once a day, you, I'm, at least I'm not alive. So, this event kind of caused that occur and I, I just uh, I wrote some little quick notes down and, and wanted to say that and to say thank you and it was a lifting to a place that uh, and, and then I, I wrote down to a place dot 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 because I can't find the words for it but I didn't want it to finish and wanted it to keep going and, and the time has gone so fast and there's been so much light in it and uh, and, and the idea of producing the great person in us, the and, and the closing quote is enough to break open one's heart and uh, close out those trite uh, spirits that invade our lives so much, and um, in kind of invite in, invite one to become uh, me and you and I and more of who we are. Anyway, thank you, and that's all. <laughs> thank you, Ray. Uh, Kim has something to say here. Please go ahead, Kim. And um, I got you ne next, Nathan. If if you want to hear more of Whitman's poetry put to uh, song and and in stage on YouTube, there is a recording of the play that Joe wrote many years ago using Whitman's words, putting them to song with two other people. And um, I'll share the link with Jerry, and he can share it on to everybody else if you want to see it. So you can always have it with you. Yeah, type it into the chat box. It is and, yeah so for all it, of us to have. It is you YouTube radical pa Whitman radical patriot. It'll come up radical patriot. Okay. You know maybe I'll do it if I can commandeer Joe's computer. Yeah, I just thought yeah. I'd let me. But okay. okay, so we're gonna go with Nathan first, and then uh, Donson. I got you. I see your hand up. We'll get you next. Go ahead, Nathan. You got the floor. Okay. Okay. So on this idea of Eden being a state of mind. Um, I was reminded of one of his poems that has always stuck with me. Um, and this is a paraphrase. I don't know the exact words. Uh, but he says, if all these worlds were to be reduced back to a pallid float, it would not avail in the long run. And then he talks about something about how we would surely build up to, to this state of evolution where we were now um, and then go further and further and further. Um, so... That came to me listening listening to um, to what Ray was saying, um, but the the real quote in the begin in the middle of the, the presentation was about and such of these, and and such of these inward tend and outwards to these and outward I tend, and I just thought about how he is identifying with the karma of the age. He's identifying with the karma of, of all these people that may be reduced back to a pallid float, but it's, it, it won't avail in, in the long run. He's, he is, um, yeah, he's identifying with the people, uh, with the race of nations, with the race of, of, uh, of, of the time. And so this, the idea that Eden, Eden is a state of mind, it's constantly available and will, will ever be available to, to us. And, and, I, and in a certain sense, it's an inevitability. Mm -hmm. Well put, Nathan. I appreciate that very much. Uh, Donson, you're up. 
Yeah, um, I, I was thinking um, Whitman, amazing, he seemed to uh, emphasize uh, um, uh, going within, getting away from the exteriors, which is emphasized by rich, you know, religions and priests and so on, and inviting us to go inward, men within men within men. And we were thinking, uh, Eden being a state of mind, we are reminded of what's mine. Mine, you know, you know, is a soap, is a source both of bondage, but also mine is a source of liberation, in which we can rise up and up. You know, I don't know who, who is the author, who is the poet who say the mind can make hell of heaven and you know, <laughs> and so on. And the heaven of hell. Yeah. And we were thinking of what is appropriate to this, you know, the secret doctrine, in, I think volume one, page 38, when it says, mind uh, is, um, uh, has to do with uh, states of consciousness, group under thought, will, and feeling. And therefore, mind can be either at the lower level, sunk with passions and exteriors, or can rise higher and higher to a higher sublime planes of, you know, of consciousness, which is what Whitman from the poems seem to be inviting us. Hmm. Yeah, beautifully put. Yeah, I think all of these transcendentalists are encouraging us spiritual mountain climbers to ascend. They're kind of giving support to the effort and energy to want to rise. That's well put. Uh, Joe, do you want to add to that? Uh, you, the only thing I would like to say is Whitman in particular, um, he, to use the metaphor of the tree, yes, he wants to bring his branches up to the sunlight, but he also wants to bring his roots deeper into the earth. So, um, it's somebody's phone. Is that raised? I can't mute it. Um, so, you know, uh, so it, it is, it, it's only, I think it's only a half truth that says he wants to um, get us away from externals because actually he, he very much in the poems wants us to get more connected with externals in many ways. Uh, to, there's his, by being this omnivorous mind and by mirroring things in an omnidirectional way that paradoxically is a form of selflessness by because he lo he loses himself in this universal reflection and at the same time he is then mirroring that heroic spirit that is linking the body and the soul as he says i am the poet of the body i am the poet of the soul um, uh, i have said that the soul is not more than the body i've said the body is not more than the soul and nothing not god is greater to oneself than one is so, so, you know, one sees in him this, a connecting, you know, antaskarana kind of thing. Um, uh, that's, you know, so, yes. Uh, not, not so much the ascetic, you know, mystic in that regard. Though there are extremely mystical abstract passages in his writing. It, it's, it seems like uh, Whitman wants to make sure that we appreciate the sanctity of incarnation, the sanctity of existence. Yes. And I think that that sentiment you just shared is mirrored in, in Thoreau's, Thoreau's quote when he said, heaven is under our feet as well as over our heads. Yes. Right. Uh, or, or at the end of Walden, he says, uh, build your castles in the sky. That's where they belong. Now put the foundation under them. Right. Right, right. Now, Laura, we were going to come back to you. Although, before we do, is Isabel still here? Because all, all of this badness is thanks to her in the Eden as a state of mind thing. So if uh, I wanted to give Isabel, if she's still with us, I don't see her name anywhere, so she might have had to sign off. That's okay. Um, Shri, do you have something to say about this Eden as a uh, state of mind before we go to Laura? I, I just have a question. If I may. Okay, so hold, if you don't mind, hold on to the question. Okay. Uh, Laura, do you want to say something about this topic or move on to your beautiful dreamer comment? Well, I think that the, um, 
the transcendence must be through the human experience. Um, it is said in the secret doctrine that being human is a transitional, um, it's a transitional state. It's a, we are not going to be human forever, but there's something very vital and important about being human that I think that if we, as Whitman points out in his poetry, we must plunge into humanity in order to transcend it. Too often in religion, we're trying to get away from the human experience because it's so painful. But I think it's important that we embrace the painful and we embrace the beauty of it. And in the voice of the silence, we are told about the two paths. And the one path is towards nirvana, to get away from the human experience. And the other is to master the human experience so that we can be the better able to help others. Because we have to understand what it means to be human. And the only way to do that is to, to embrace it and work through it. And I think Joseph put it very well. And the other comment is just uh, to let you know that the film is available on YouTube, free, Beautiful Dreamers, 1990. Be careful, there are a lot of beautiful dreamers out there, films. Um, so make sure you get the right one. And um, it's the story of um, Whitman's visit to London. And when he met with the superintendent of um, the insane asylum, the, as it was called back then. And um, he spent, um, Whitman spent some time living with um, Buck and his wife and children. And uh, it was Whitman that, um, his meeting with Whitman that brought about his change in um, his treatment towards the patients of the hospital. And he became, as it says, um, uh, one of the most important biographers, biographers of Walt Whitman as well. So watch the film if you can. It's a lovely one. Thank you, Laura. Shri? Yeah, uh, the question I had is that there's a quote of Emerson which says that leaves of grass is a mixture of Bhagavad Gita and the New York Herald. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering whether somebody could <laughs> say something about this. That was, I, I believe that was in a letter he sent to Carlisle when he sent the copy of the book. That he, he called it a mixture of the Bhagavad Gita and the, the New York Herald, yes. And so, yes, of course, that's, you know, uh, that's, you know, I talked a little bit about the, how Whitman has these, you know, long lists of observations, these snapshots, this, this mental slideshow that he's trying to put the reader through at times that can seem uh, uh, burdensome in its detail. And I, th I think that was a reference to that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and another piece uh, says here that uh, it, most of his writing belonged to the mainstream of Indian philosophy. This is written by Malcolm Cowley. Yes, yeah, yeah, also, you know, when Thoreau visited him, he said, um, he s said to Whitman, you know, well, you know, a lot of your, the, the poems remind me of the uh, Eastern writings. Um, do you know about those? And apparently Whitman put him off and said, no, why don't you tell me about them? So he, he seemed to feign uh, ignorance of the, you know, of the, of the Gita or the Upanishads. Um, uh, and, you know, who's, who's to say? I mean, he obviously knew about them because in later editions of, the, of Leaves, he quotes, you know, and makes references to all those writings. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Joe, I wanted to ask you if you thought there was any connections or parallels between the modern lyricist and, and songwriter Leonard Cohen and his, I'm thinking of like the song Hallelujah, and the manner in which 
Whitman wrote. I wonder if there was some connection that you think might lie between these two poets. Well, just briefly, I mean, that's a huge question. It's, there's, it, um, you know, I, you know that, that um, conceit in the, in the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, that uh, the, the main character, uh, it, the idea is if he suddenly didn't exist, how would the modern world change? I think that would be an interesting thing to witness with Whitman. You know, if Whitman didn't exist, how would uh, our, the Amer American culture and arts change because I think he had a huge influence. I mean, there's, he's, people connect him with jazz, the whole sensibility around jazz, the emphasis on spontaneity, the emphasis in, in the beauty of, of, of non-refinement, of, of a kind of a roughness. Um, and of course, you know, so many of the songwriters, not just Leonard Cohen, but many of them, um, you know, Leonard Cohen is a great example because of the candidness of, and his, um, you know, in the sense of the sacred that's underneath uh, so many of his pieces. But it's a, it's a, you know, it's a really great question. We're kind of running out of time. And what I would like to do is just make a couple of closing statements. If anyone wants to stick around after we're done here, uh, feel free to do so. I'll keep the meeting running. But I'm going to bring it to a close. I need to show you something real quick. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, on the Universal Theosophy website, you know, we've been promoting this lecture series. We're going to pick up in February of next year uh, another lecture series that we'll invite you all to. Uh, it's going to be on Theosophical Symbolism and Nature. So uh, more information will be coming uh, on that score. If you're interested in... Um, Jerry, do you think your sorry, Jerry? Do you think your screen is shared because it's not right now? Oh, you don't see a thing. No. I'm so sorry. I I was thinking that it was shared. Okay, where did it go? Oh, hang on. I've hit the share button first. Yeah, there you go. my bad. <laughs> okay, so uh, universal universaltheosophy.com, where we've been promoting this lecture series, we'll be starting to. Um, post uh, future events and you can come here to learn more about them. But what I wanted to tell you is that um, for those of you who want to keep conversations going uh, along some of these lines, there are on uh, Thursday nights four different classes that we're conducting uh, through the auspices of Universal Theosophy. Uh, the first Thursday of the month, it's the Gita. We're talking about the Gita. It's, uh, the second, we're going through uh, un the Universal Theosophy book by Robert Crosby. The third Thursday, we have a Plato and Shakespeare discussion group. And then the last Thursday of the month, um, there's an introduction to the secret doctrine, the voice of the silence. The... Uh, syllabus for each one of these classes is listed on the website so you can see what we're doing, what we're covering, and what we're talking about. And you're all welcome to join. Um, you can go to universaltheosophy at gmail.com if you would like to leave your email address um, so that we can keep in touch with you for future activities. And then I'll stop sharing the screen now. I just wanted to thank everybody who um, both attended and offered their thoughts and comments after it was over. But I do want to just say that all of the speakers in the lecture series, interestingly enough, had spent a, a rather significant amount of time through, you know, their adulthood thinking and contemplating about these writers and their thoughts and ideas. And I think it really came through that genuine love for these great souls, these wonderful souls, and their contribution to world culture. Um, I, I can't thank enough all the people who put the energy and time into presenting these thinkers and in and, and the way that they did. Uh, and it wasn't just in what they had to say, but the, the beautiful uh, complement of images and music that was supplied as well. Okay, so we'll, for anyone who needs to move on in their evening, feel free to, to uh, say their goodbyes. And we'll, uh, we'll hang on the line here. And if anyone has questions for Joe, uh, for the next, say, 15 minutes, we'll hang on for a little bit longer. So thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you.
Okay, would anyone like to raise a, a further thought or comment or question for Joe? Go ahead, Kirk. Well, this kind of is a kind of a continuation of uh, what was being discussed earlier uh, regarding uh, Eden as a state of mind. Um, I, I get very much and I appreciate uh, Whitman's uh, willingness to, as you put it, uh, sort of expose the persona, to shine a bright light on what is uh, uh, hidden in the shadows, so to speak. Um, and also to, and, and, not, and, and not at all be shy, shy or ashamed of it. But at the same time, um, he obviously was speaking to our higher nature and, um, and a, a, a full appreciation for an identification with uh, the, the spirit, uh, the higher spirit in man and women and uh, trying to draw that forth. And he certainly does that in, in a, in a uh, remarkable way through his poetry in so many ways. But how would you, Joe, how would you characterize the, um, the manner in which he, he brings those two together? In other words, you know, in theosophy, we have this idea that evolution constitutes this uh, progressive transformation of the personal. Uh, so that it becomes, in time, a fit vehicle for the divine. But how, how, would, you, how would you characterize the way Whitman uh, portrays that, the relationship and, um, and evolution of the persona? Um, well, hmm, that sounds like a, a big and interesting question. Um, but, uh, you know, what what strikes me is uh, you um, you have to see he's a he's a poet of the new world. So if you read Emerson's first paragraph that he published, which was in his essay on nature, you'll see that it's a call for original American culture and a call from liberty from the habits of Europe. Um, and then, of course, that's something Emerson repeated again and again, and especially in that essay on the poet, which Whitman heard live, a live lecture when he was 22. Um, and, and if you compare that first paragraph then with Whitman's first paragraph in his preface in 1855, you will see the two paragraphs are parallel. Both of them, the, the first things they published, um, uh, Whitman's call for an original American culture. So in some sense, you know, as for the personal, it's a matter of removing obstructions, removing pretenses, removing calcified, right in that introduction that uh, Russ, Russ gave, uh, Emerson was talking about the calcification of language, the calcification of thought forms, the mere pretense, the focus on externals only, all of that uh, lingua franca of of Europe, they they wanted to make a cut from that, and I think that's getting at the very core. One of the core points of the reform of the transcendentalists was their calling for an original American culture and a freedom from all that. So Whitman's casualness and his candidness are an attempt to to you know to come back to what we really are. And of course, if you are a if you ha are encumbered with all the the Christian ideas you know, at the time, you know, you're, fe you're feeling like a lot of, all of that stuff is what's supporting you. It's hiding your evil nature. If you were to let go of all of that, you would, your evilness would shine through. And that's why he is trying to break through the shadows, um, as I was trying to point out in the lecture. So, uh, you know, he, he's, he's giving, he wants to connect people with the basics of life, that the, that the wealthy aristocrats were, you know, separated from. So he wants to emphasize the basic trades. He wants to make sure that, uh, he, he wants to believe that literature is available to the common person. That's a new idea, you know, and that the subject of the literature is not, you know, the gods and it's not the wealthy, it's the ordinary trades and things. You know, he's, he's he, at one point he's bringing up the mythologies and he's saying, you know, he sees as, 
you know, rather than Cronus and Zeus, he sees as much in a carpenter raising his hammer or in the, you know, in the team teamster riding his horses and stuff. So uh, he wants to connect people with a, with a basic sense of of wonder within them. And from that primal connection, from letting go of that pretense, I think there is then the positive possibility of rising, you know, spiritually. But I think, you know, maybe the thrust of his work is not so much the high spiritual culture at first as trying to clear away, as as H.P. Blavatsky was, uh, or Judge was saying about the messengers, that why are the messengers in the U.S. and Europe and not and, you know, because they have the work to do of clearing away the, um, the growth. And so, so that it, once that work is done, then the adepts can come and do what they need to do. You know, so I, I think that's how I would attempt to answer that. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Dawson. Yeah. In, in, the, in the presentation, the poem, there's that beautiful presentation about universal brotherhood. Then close up continents and thought and I mean it is so uh, you know amazing, which raises the question um, about to have that sense of universal brotherhood and close up continents, humanity and so on. Uh, what what does it what does it in, involve in, in relation to how we view a human being as well as nature? Returning to you, Joe. Well, I, I think we could open that up to anyone that might have a have thoughts on that. We'll start with you, though. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it, Donson's bringing up both human nature and nature itself, and of course that we find that in Whitman, it's not going to be one or the other. Um, Whitman was not somebody who believed that. You know, although it'd be interesting if he was alive today, that the human humanity is some sort of parasite on nature, uh, which we're you know we're trying to decide now for ourselves if we're that or not. Um, uh, nor that humanity is you know some elevated godlike creature that uh, is you know merely uses nature. So so he was you know both had to be involved, and he he had to do, see the divinity. You know, I believe a leaf of grass is no less than the journey work of the stars, and a pismire is equally perfect, and the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. He has these long uh, songs in praise of the divinity within nature, and of course, his metaphor of the grass is is um, is not only what is commonest and nearest and grows equally under the feet of slaves as under the landholders and is, you know, but also uh, grass was the symbol of the, his very poems, that this book was a kind of spontaneous um, upsurging of creativity from someone who had done the inner work. So it, it had the effortlessness and spontaneity of it as, as the growing of grass was. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Would anyone else like to add to that? Go ahead, Dre. Well, what, what, what something that you know, interests me in this whole presentation and with almost all, virtually every comment is that somehow more than for whatever reasons, the other three presentations, and I don't understand this, but I can just sense it, that um, this is brought out both possibilities and dimensions of the topics that we're talking about, which have been the same in all three. Basically, what you just summarized, Joe, I mean, uh, summarized in, uh, yeah, uh, in, in the last um, few comments that you made, Joe, that, um, and so my, my question, I hope, is just a continuation of this, but, but could you make a comment about what is the, this expression of, the, the um, note or letter or whatever that Baxter and Judge sent to um, Whitman on the poet occultism or poetic occultism. I'm not sure which it was, but was what was that? It sounds like an interesting combination of these two fellows carrying on a beginning or whatever, a dialogue with Whitman, but it relates in a sense to, I think, what we're speaking of now. Mm -hmm. 
he uh, um, what they sent was it wasn't a letter, but they sent the issue that issue of the path with the article in it. Um, it was I'm sure it was through Baxter's you know his friendship with Whitman and his working with Judge on the publication of the path that um, you know had something to do with I mean I don't know obviously Judge's attention had been turned towards Whitman because he comes up repeatedly um, in his writings and. Uh, so that so that is a that's an article particularly you can look it up um, okay. uh, I haven't read in the that. path in the path archives but it's an article particularly devoted to Whitman's poetry and so they Baxter brought him back a copy and we know this because in uh, for a couple years in his old age uh, Whitman's friend Horace Trabell was visiting him usually daily and Horace Trabell had an incredible uh, mind and ability to take shorthand so he took verbatim notes of their conversations and of Whitman's comments upon all kinds of things in the world and the arts and his own. And, and, the, and Trabell eventually transcribed all these and published them in a series of volumes. So we, we know a lot about, we were a fly on the wall in Whitman's world. So Horace Trabell was there when the, you know, when the path was, copy of the path was sitting on uh, Whitman's lap after he had read the article and then he was talking to him about it. So. Thank you. My goodness. I noticed that Natasha, you're uh, unmuted. So maybe would you like to add anything to what we're talking about? Any thoughts? Or Jonathan, we haven't heard from you. Would you like to add any thoughts of um, or questions? Um. I just think that this whole series has just been absolutely splendid. Unfortunately, I had to run out of the room way too many times. Every time I came back, somebody was doing something just brilliant. And Joe's presentation is just the beautiful reading of hearing Joe's voice and all you guys' voices. It's just been very meaningful. So thank you very much. Thanks, John. How about you, Wes? We haven't heard from you. Aqua, I'm going to go to you too in a minute. Go ahead, Wes. Well, I'll try. Uh, well, Whitman seems to be this, this advocate for a more universal, more um, earthy kind of human being. And I was wondering if and the question is, is how does that uh, fit or with, or does it conflict with the whole idea you see in the Voice of the Silence about uh, rising above the personality and so forth. And I, I just been kind of wondering that as sort of a theme because it seems like Whitman is, just throws a monkey wrench into the Western sort of uh, conceit about what it means to be a good person or a, a, an upright citizen, a, a citizen of the British or American world or something. And, and, and puts that whole question of the, the, the and, personality and individuality into a whole new wonderful rough life or light. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if something can be said about that. Sorry for the voice. Laura, go ahead. You want to respond to the question? Well, having listened over and over again to his poetry and the, the roughness of the human experience, um, you find yourself moving into a place of transcendence. You find yourself through the roughness, through the humanity of his poetry. You find yourself moving to a transcendental place where you are watching it. And then you realize that um, you are not all these things. That, But yet while you're in them, they they control you. I often, when we listen to my captain, my captain, long have we sailed together. What comes to mind is he's saying goodbye to his body. And if you think of that, while we're on this physical plane, the body is in charge. The personality is in charge. We have to work through it. And there's no escaping it while we're on this plane. But Whitman does recognize the self working from that higher point of view. 
And so when you embrace all his writings in one huge, confusing, sensual lump, you find yourself moving out of the sensual into something else. Mm -hmm. you know, Kirk wanted to say something. After Kirk, I'm going to ask if Aquil or Natasha would like to say something. And there's a person here that ZZ and an iPad. I have no clue who you guys are. But if you want to chime in, just go ahead and unmute. But Kirk, we're going to go to you next. Just very briefly, uh, uh, this is kind of an answer to my own question in a way as well, because um, I think perhaps one way to look at what Whitman does is it's an emphasis on, um, of course, that the whole idea that the deity is within each of us, but has to be accessed through an immense struggle. So I was thinking last night, I, was, uh, I heard an interview with Allen Ginsberg, who Whitman was his favorite, and he spoke of this particular poem he said was the greatest poem, in his view, that Whitman wrote, was uh, in, the, uh, in the Cradle Endlessly Rocking. And I went back and I read it, and it's, it, it is like a, it depicts a person who's walking along the seashore, uh, and almost as though that through successive lives, as Laura was mentioning, aspiring, trying to hear the words of the spirit and soul within them, and just barely uh, being able to, sort of like it's on the edge of being audible, and, it, and every now and then a word comes through, but, but the, the poet knows that it's not the full word, it's not the whole world word, it's not everything that can be revealed. And so the, the poem is about this endless longing to hear that which is unheard by the Spirit. So in, in one sense, I think you could say that that's, that perhaps depicts Whitman in, um, um, in, a, in, a, uh, in the light of his spiritual aspiration as being at the forefront of what he was about, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh I'm, I'm probably butchering your name, but there's a A-Q-U-I-L, I'm going to pronounce it Aquil, and Natasha, and an iPad person, and a ZZ person. Any of you would like to chime in, just go ahead and un unmute and just say your piece. We'd love to hear from you. Okay, so, but feel free. We, I'm going to go five more minutes. Uh, I, I have a comment of my own, Joe. Um, we, we, you know, when you, when you uh, look at the mystical tradition of mankind, um, scholars like to uh, create categories for things. <laughs> so they have this idea that via negativa and via positiva as being two different directions uh, in which mystics tend to go. And the, 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 mystic, um, the mystical tradition in the East, perhaps, in many respects, you might say has a, a bit of an emphasis on the via negativa. You know, I'm not this. I'm not my personality. I'm not my my body. I'm not this. I'm not that. And in a, a desire to withdraw from the physical plane and try to ascend in consciousness to something more universal. But then it seems Whitman is maybe part more part of that you might call the via positiva tradition, where the selflessness is achieved not so much from withdrawing, but from identification with everything around one. In other words, there, he, he, he is adept at placing his consciousness within the lives of others. And therefore, some, putting his own personality on the back burner while he enjoys this position of witness position of entering into the lives of not and not just other human beings but other creatures even or, or the ocean <laughs> or a tree and i and i just think that that's a, a to, to the spiritual tra uh, tradition of mankind it's such a wonderful contribution to because it's something all of us can do it doesn't require any extra skill it, it just it re requires a desire to say, let me try just for a moment to imagine what my life would be like if I were living as that person, or if I were a bird, or if I were this other friend of mine. And I just think it's a very, um, 
one of the things I got out of Whitman was this desire to try that out, <laughs> try to, to, to imagine myself in the lives of others. That's a wonderful comment, Jerry. That's great to put it in that in that context. It, I think that's really clarifying. It brings to mind um, that comment of the um, when the material is ready, the architect will appear. The, the difference between Eastern and Western occultism, HBB puts very clearly in the key to theosophy, that previously we were dependent upon um, teachers, gurus. We followed their instructions. We did what they, we, we were told, and we learned from that. But in Western occultism, it is by self-induced and self-devised effort. And I think that what we're doing right now is we're preparing the material. We have to, each one of us has to do that from within ourselves to prepare that material for the architect to appear again. And so our, as HPB said, our growth in our effort now is by self-effort. It's what we have to do. We have to prepare the ground. A great point. Joe, we're going to give you the last word and then we'll close down our meeting. Uh, I'll, I'll leave you then with an anecdote that just came to mind, uh, which is a fitting ending, I think. Uh, I was uh, in New York City for the first time in my life in December of the year 2000. And uh, I knew in going to New York City, I was, it was on my mind that, oh, you know, Whitman was here. You know, what was it like, you know, I mean, am I walking on the streets? You know, he was, he became excited by all the human activity. And I could feel that energy thrill in me too, looking at the cathedrals and looking at the skyscrapers built right next to them, seeing, seeing God surpassed by economy and industry. Um, and uh, so uh, I was wondering if I would meet Whitman. And um, I happened to be wandering on Fifth Avenue, I think it was, during the Christmas rush. So it's like the week before Christmas and the cr shoppers walking up and down, all of that bustle. And I walked by a jewelry store, which had an absolutely tasteless display going on, a video screen with a couple uh, nearly nude models um, rolling around on the ground of some estate, a completely pointless, random thing, uh, wearing wearing hardly anything but jewelry. And... Uh, <laughs> you know, falling into the pool, then rolling on the hillside and rolling on the, you know. And as I was watching this, suddenly out of the speaker uh, above me, I was accosted by a woman's voice, a woman saying, passing stranger, you do not know how lovingly I look upon you. Perhaps <laughs> we had known each other in a past birth. Perhaps we were brother and so, you know, and this was going. And I was certain that somebody had been hired for a minimum wage to, you know, have a microphone and, and accost people. And I was looking around and, and the people are passing me by, I'm standing, and suddenly I realize, wait, 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 this is Whitman's poem. <laughs> <laughs> and I stood there, you know, I stood there just stunned. The people coming by, it was for me alone. Nobody else knew, nobody else would stop and listen to that. <laughs> but I knew what it was. And the absurdity of it, the utter tastelessness of the, everything about it just kind of popped my head open. And <laughs> I was absolutely charmed. You know, I knew Whitman would be charmed too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. All right, guys. You guys all have a wonderful rest of your day and evening, and we will um, hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Jerry, for being Thank the you. thread for all of this. You bet. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.